a beautiful spring day out in the park, uh, May 14th. Um, some really good news. Again, another good sign that everything is going to get back to normal. The Monday, we'll have a physical CC back on KCC North. Uh, and we should have the conference room back, which is great. Um, we have to make sure that it has uh, Zoom capability and we'll figure out what the uh, attendance schedule of the live conference is. We actually have Zoom COVID schedule through the end of this month um, and we'll work on uh, how we'll proceed next month. Um, really very, very pleased and actually honored and very proud that Today's speaker is Greg Serrao. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Greg. He's currently Assistant Professor of Medicine and Director of the Mechanical Circulatory Support Team um, for Mount Sinai Heart and for the Cardiac Cath Lab. Those of you who are paying a fortune for college education, I want you to eat your heart out to know that Greg got a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering at Cooper Union zero tuition only for brilliant people then develop he then got a master's of science in biomedical engineering at columbia university um is it that correct the fu is that is that an error school <laughs> <laughs> he completed medical school here at mount sinai um he then went um to columbia for internship and residency. And we were thrilled and privileged when he came back here as cardiology fellow. He was the chief cardiology fellow. He had the position of have a three feet as three time voted by the health I want, I want to listen best to the health and fellow. Uh, a distinction that no one has been to uh, in all of the years that the award has been given out. Um, he then did an interventional cardiology fellowship where he was chief fellow working with Dr. Kinney and Dr. Sharma. He then gravitated towards mechanical support, which probably dovetailed well with his interest in engineering. And again, following in models that Dr. Fuster has said is to pursue your interest. He actually went, he went to Oklahoma. Is that right, Greg? Oklahoma, yeah. Where he, um, left his family for a period of time where he basically did like a sub-internship learning technology from people who had advanced the field. He then came back and had the difficult job of really coordinating services between cardiothoracic surgery and Dr. Ani Wala and uh, Dr. Pawali um, served as mentors there working with the heart failure team, Sean and, and his team. Uh, and with uh, the mentorship of Dr. Kinney and Sharma, we're able to put together all of these pieces to really increase um, of the reputation of Sinai's mechanical support uh, and certainly the volume. And we've seen that come uh, to a very important point here during the COVID season. Um, and because of that, it's really great honor and privilege uh, to introduce Greg Serral, who's going to present today's shop in the role of mechanical circulatory support in the COVID era. Greg, you have to live up to that. Yeah, that's, uh, that was quite the introduction. Thanks, Dr. Goldman. Um, so I, I modified the title of the talk just a little bit from what was uh, advertised to shock and the role for mechanical circulatory support because as you'll see, the, um, uh, a lot of the mechanical circulatory support calls that, that we've been receiving have actually not necessarily been for shock. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna talk about two groups of patients that we've been helping care for. Uh, one group is those who have circulatory shock, and then another group are those who have refractory ARDS. Uh, so first I'll talk about those who have circulatory shock. Now, uh, I'm going to start at a, a pretty basic level, which uh, a lot of you who have worked COVID at this point, uh, especially the fellows who have been in the ICU so much, you know, probably have a, a structure like this in your head. But uh, for those of you who haven't seen as many patients, this, uh, this structure took me a couple weeks to put together in my head, just the evaluation of shock in general. Uh, for someone who has COVID. And we all know that there's, you know, several main categories of shock and it's, it's no different with, uh, with COVID, but I think the uh, relative frequency and etiology of each of these shocks is a little bit unique in COVID. Um, so first is vasodilatory shock. Um, and, you know, unlike most vasodilatory shock that we see that's usually due to bacterial sepsis, uh, this is uh, due to that cytokine release syndrome that we often see. 
Um, some patients do have superimposed bacterial sepsis, but I would say this is definitely the minority. Um, now, this uh, vasodilatory shock syndrome is being treated in the pediatric population with uh, mechanical circulatory support, uh, but because of the high flow rates that you would need to achieve to do this meaningfully in adults, uh, it is prohibitive. So, uh, if vasodilatory shock is identified on an evaluation, this is a, a no-go for mechanical support. Uh, same story goes with hemorrhagic shock. So, you know, as we are continuing to learn, and we saw from the paper in Jack last week, um, that the frequent use of anticoagulation, even thrombolytics, um, is being sought after as a way to reduce mortality in COVID. Uh, but it's also important to remember that we're doing everything we can to limit provider exposure, which I think is appropriate, which means low frequency of blood draws. Uh, so frequent use of anticoagulation combined with low frequency of blood draws uh, does lead to bleeding. And uh, you know, there's been several instances of delayed in identification of hemorrhagic shock uh, because of the combination of these two things. So again, because hemorrhagic shock is a strict contraindication to mechanical support, it's something that needs to just be thought about early and excluded before proceeding. Uh, obstructive shock comes in different forms, uh, some cardiac, some non. Um, so there's three categories here I was gonna talk about. One is pericardial tamponade. So I think over our experience here at Sinai specifically, I think uh, the interventional group has had to drain a total of three pericardial effusions in COVID patients. Um, only one of those patients pre presented in true tamponade and shock due to this effusion. Uh, but there are multiple case reports, including one that was published in Jack last week about cardiac uh, tamponade secondary to COVID-19. So it is something that we should keep on the uh, differential. Uh, pneumothorax, on the other hand, has been uh, very frequent. Uh, high PEEP strategies that are being used in the ICU have led to uh, significant improvements in oxygenation, but very frequent barotrauma. And I would say that pneumothorax is definitely one of the most frequent causes of uh, acute hemodynamic deterioration. So when considering whether or not to proceed with mechanical support, uh, it's almost mandatory to have a chest x-ray from within the last uh, few hours just to exclude the possibility that a chest tube may solve the problem because of a new pneumothorax. Uh, pulmonary embolism, also very, very common. Again, like we said, the uh, rate of thromboembolism with COVID is, is higher, and this uh, thromboembolic phenomena can include pulmonary embolism. Now, there's a lot of uh, point of care echoes being done that uh, sometimes are, are difficult to interpret. Dr. Croft, I think I saw her there, knows that whenever I get them, I text them right to her just to make sure that I'm interpreting them the right way. But there have also been several instances of uh, just observed objective mobile thrombi and the RARV in the setting of shock. And I think that's the closest we've come in uh, live patients to uh, at least making the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism because we don't have CTAs on these patients they're often too unstable to move and too high risk because of uh, provider exposure. Uh, cardiogenic shock uh, is definitely there. I think that uh, we probably, from hearing from other countries before we started our own experience here, we're told that uh, cardiogenic shock, two things about it. One is that uh, it was going to be common, and I don't think that's been our experience. And the other thing is that it's often a manifestation of end-stage disease, which is almost uniformly fatal, which is also not our experience here. Uh, but still, when we get to this point of the evaluation and we finally see cardiogenic shock, you know, I, I feel very happy because this is finally something that uh, feels familiar again, something that we could treat, um, and something that we've had very good success with, specifically with, uh, with COVID. Uh, so these are the patients that benefit most from a, strong, uh, a very thorough evaluation for mechanical support. So because I have two groups of patients to go over, I'm not gonna you know, go too into specifics, but I think this is the framework that I put together in my head uh, over the past few weeks and months for both COVID and non-COVID, uh, you know, with the mentorship of uh, Dr. Sharma, Kinney, Dr. Rani, um, and all of the heart failure groups. So the, the three main questions that I think you have to ask yourself when you're considering um, mechanical support for cardiogenic shock is specifically for COVID, the question is, can I do it at the bedside? I think we want to do everything we can to limit moving these people to uh, contaminating another area of the hospital, like a procedural suite or a, a cath lab or an operating room. So being done at the bedside is definitely a benefit. Um, this, this question uh, took me a while to, to uh, consistently think about, but uh, it's a little wordy, but does placing univentricular support risk precipitating frank failure of the other ventricle? 
meaning that now that we have Impella devices and tandem hearts, we can elect to put mechanical support just for one of the two ventricles, either the left ventricle or the right ventricle. More commonly, if we're putting support for one ventricle, we're putting it in the left ventricle, and most commonly that means Impella. So we haven't used Impella for COVID, and uh, the reason for that is that we're predominantly seeing biventricular involvement. Sometimes the RV is mildly down, sometimes it's severely down, but the thing you have to consider is does placing an impella in the left ventricle and giving an additional 3.5 liters of flow to the right ventricle, is that gonna precipitate frank failure of the right ventricle? And that's definitely happened in other cases besides COVID. Um, and instead of getting worse from placement of impella, the, uh, instead of getting better from placement of impella, the patient actually gets worse. So this question really needs to be thought about and you know the images need to be reviewed as a group and discussed as a group of uh, can the right ventricle handle the flow of the impella. And then when it comes to advanced mechanical support like ECMO specifically, um, you have to think about how bad are the lungs. And uh, this creates a, a unique physiology um, that I'm gonna borrow some slides from a previous talk I gave. Um, when you're doing femoral ECMO and you're returning blood into the femoral artery, um, if the heart is not working at all, it's very easy to fill the entire aorta uh, with flow that's coming from the ECMO machine that has oxygen in it, which is depicted here as red blood. And you can see that red blood on the left in a, in a heart that's not functioning fills almost the entire arch all the way up into the coronaries. However, you know, in situations where the heart is only, uh, is working at least a little bit and the lungs are severely diseased like you have in COVID, you have at least some of the patient's native cardiac output going through the heart, going through the native lungs and picking up oxygen from there and then be, being ejected specifically into the proximal uh, part of the ascending aorta and the arch. Um, exactly how much is filled by this native blood flow is dependent upon your ECMO flow and how strong the heart is, but in COVID, there's at least some, and the amount of oxygen in this blood is significantly reduced compared to other patients that are treated with cardiogenic shock because of how diseased their lungs are. Uh, so this is just a picture here depicting the same. This is the arch and you have at least some of the arch that's being filled with blue blood that's severely deoxygenated because it's going through COVID lungs. Um, and then you have the red blood, which is coming from the ECMO machine. And if your blue blood is going across uh, to your left subclavian, you're gonna be having blue blood go to your brain because that's where the carotids come off of. Uh, so it's very important that you find some way to oxygenate uh, the blood that's in the uh, ascending aorta and the proximal part of the arch especially. So how do you do this? Well, the way you do this is with something called hybrid ECMO. Um, and there's multiple different ways to do this, but I would say the most common here is something called uh, BAV ECMO. And what BAV ECMO means is that you have, instead of uh, the normal two cannulas to provide flow from the ECMO circuit, you use three. You have one line that drains from the right atrium, and then the, that line drains from the right atrium, goes into the ECMO machine, and instead of going into the ECMO machine and then just returning into the femoral artery, you use a splitter. And the splitter returns most of the blood to the femoral artery, but returns some of the blood directly through the internal jugular vein into the right atrium. And what this accomplishes is, is that it provides oxygenated blood pre-lung so that it doesn't matter what happens when the right ventricle pumps the blood through the lung, it's oxygenated when it comes out and achieves that goal of oxygenating the ascending aorta and the proximal arch. So what am I really trying to say? I'm trying to say in a very uh, complicated way that putting VA ECMO for COVID patients because they have such diseased lungs is a very complicated thing to do. As you can see this picture on the left, you can imagine taking care of these patients is uh, even more complicated than taking care of a standard ECMO patient. So this is something that uh, we have tried to avoid at all costs. And for that reason, the use of ECMO for cardiogenic shock both here and at other centers has been exceedingly low. Uh, so at this point, I think we could say officially that our balloon pump is the, afford, uh, the preferred approach here for cardiogenic shock uh, in the setting of COVID. And it's for all the reasons that I mentioned. Uh, it can be easily done at the bedside. Almost all of the balloon pumps that we've placed for cardiogenic shock have been done at the bedside. Um, it doesn't really matter how bad the RV is because uh, the flow, the augmentation that you'll get a balloon, from a balloon pump will be very unlikely to overload the right ventricle. So almost always the right ventricle will be able to handle the augmentation from a balloon pump. Uh, once the balloon pump is in, the maintenance is minimal and therefore nursing exposure is minimal, which is an important thing to consider. And the other benefit is, is that it doesn't leave the patient uh, with no options 
once the balloon pump is in, it can be rapidly exchanged for an arterial inflow for ECMO if needed. So uh, you still have options available if the patient, uh, you know, declares themselves as needing more than balloon pump support for, for shock. Uh, so in terms of our experience here for cardiogenic shock, so we've treated eight patients uh, with reduced EF and circulatory shock. Of the eight, we've had uh, actually pretty good success. We've had one die, uh, but this was a patient that was referred late and received, uh, was transferred here uh, in extremis. So uh, that was a patient that we, we chose to palliate. But of the seven that we've treated, um, three have required mechanical support with a balloon pump and four have been treated with medical therapy. Um, one of them is still in the hospital, but the rest of them have all been uh, discharged home, and not only discharged home, but discharged home with no uh, permanent sequela from COVID, full recovery of all end organs that were affected, including their heart, with either uh, normalization or near normalization of their ejection fraction. And uh, this cohort has unique characteristics. Uh, they all tend to be young males. Uh, I think most patients were under the age of 30, though we did have a few in the 30s. They have not been obese. Uh, their lung findings, while uh, there, they were mild compared to the severity of their shock presentation. And uh, I have to give a lot of credit to Dr. Niebard and the heart failure group here, but uh, with the steroid protocol that has been uh, honed through the experience with these patients, uh, they have all improved rapidly with the use of steroids and just supportive care as usual for uh, cardiogenic vasodilatory shock. Uh, interestingly, most by the time they get here are already antibody positive. I'm not really, we're not really too sure what that means, uh, but we have public or submitted for publication uh, sort of our experience with this group and our guesses as to what this means. And uh, I, I, we do think that this is uh, analogous to the um, up and coming discussed pediatric syndrome of this Kawasaki like uh, disease that uh, is uniquely affecting the pediatric population with COVID. Uh, so now I'm just going to get into talking about that second group, which is the group with refractory ARDS. And uh, definitely the calls for this group have been much more frequent than for those with circulatory shock. Um, but unfortunately, I think the outcomes with this group, both here and elsewhere, have been uh, poorer um, because of uh, how uh, advanced your COVID disease needs to be before we receive this phone call. Um, so just to go through the basics a little bit um, for a reminder for the fellows. Um, so when you're using ECMO to treat refractory ARDS, the purpose of ECMO here is to uh, just oxygen, to take over the function of the lungs by oxygenating the blood and removing carbon dioxide. So you're not really looking to support the blood pressure, support the heart, you're just looking to support the lungs. And the way that you do this with ECMO is with what's called a BV configuration, which means that you're draining from a vein, usually the IVC, and then you're returning to another vein, usually the internal jugular vein, um, and you're just oxygenating the blood, so it doesn't matter what happens when the blood goes through the lungs, it's already oxygenated pre-lung. Uh, so there's a couple of technical ways to do this, both of which have been used here for both COVID and other reasons, um, and it comes down to whether or not you want to cannulate with uh, two sites of access or if you want to use single access. Uh, and when you use two sites of access, it means that you're draining from one vein and uh, returning it back into another vein after it goes through the ECMO machine. And the two most common sites that uh, you'll see that done for is drainage from the femoral vein uh, from the IVC and then return to the internal jugular vein uh, into the SVC. Uh, so this is a very common setup. Um, it, alternatively, uh, a very sort of nice and fancy way to do it with one access point is to just go in the internal jugular vein and use what you know I explain as just a, a massive Shiley catheter. Uh, it works just like a Shiley catheter. It's a two-port catheter, and uh, one of the lumens is used to suck blood from, and the other lumen is used to shoot blood back into, and you're able to accomplish this goal of uh, removing blood and then reinserting it post-ECMO all through one axis site. The downside of this is twofold. One, the line is huge uh, compared to a regular Shiley, which is 11 French. This is a 31 French line, so it's very, very big. Um, and then on top of that, uh, imaging guidance is mandatory um, when inserting this because of the risk of placing it inside the ventricle and then causing cardiac tamponade. So because we've been trying to limit the motion of these people uh, with COVID, uh, we've strayed away from using single access. But uh, Dr. Ani has uh, invented a sort of hybrid way of using a x-ray machine in the room to confirm guide wire placement and has still been able to, um, to use these lines. So it's a very interesting and novel technique that he's done in a very safe fashion. 
Um, so in general, you know, theoretically speaking, why should it work? Well, the two main things that ECMO does is that it can provide oxygenation, it can remove carbon dioxide and therefore uh, replace ventilation. But the most important thing is that it could achieve both of these things, oxygenation and ventilation, without the use of positive pressure. Um, the, one of the main, main uh, negative sequelae from being on a ventilator for a prolonged period of time is that the positive pressure that's coming from the ventilator uh, induces further lung injury and can even uh, induce uh, multi-organ failure um, through cytokine signaling uh, that's been found in studies just from repetitive um, damaging positive pressure. So being able to achieve adequate oxygenation and ventilation while removing positive pressure theoretically should really help a patient recover by uh, limiting further lung injury. Uh, does this pan out in real life? Well, these are the two main trials and, you know, the use of VV ECMO for both uh, COVID ARDS and non-COVID ARDS has been uh, fraught with uh, controversy uh, for a long time now. But the two main studies that people point to when they discuss does ECMO work or not for severe ARDS, the first is the CSER, which came in 2009. And what this was is a, it's a one-to-one -one randomized trial of conventional management versus transfer to an ECMO center. Um, unlike which is common now, uh, when patients were transferred from one hospital to another, no one was transferred on ECMO. Um, these days, people will you know, go to that sending hospital, place the patient on ECMO there, and then take them back to the uh, receiving center uh, to ensure the safety of transport. In this study, that was not used. Uh, and they looked at a primary outcome of survival to six months without severe disability. And what they found was significantly better survival in the ECMO group versus the conventional group. But one of the main criticisms with this trial and the difficulty with understanding it is, is that uh, about a quarter of the patients who were transferred to the ECMO center for ECMO did not receive ECMO because in the experimental group, all you had to do was be transferred to an ECMO center and not necessarily cannulated for ECMO. So what this led the sort of non-believer group to say, is that, well, it's just because they received better care at an ECMO center and it wasn't ECMO itself that resulted in the mortality decrease. So to answer that question, this trial was designed in 2018. It was called EOLIA. And this was specifically randomization to ventilator versus VV ECMO. And they used very strict ventilator protocols to remove the possibility that the VV ECMO group was just getting better ventilator management. Um, but the downside with this trial is that out of an ethical concern for those who believe in ECMO, if you had refractory hypoxemia despite adequate ventilator management, you were allowed crossover to ECMO. And there was large crossover from the ventilator group to the VV ECMO. So they wanted to look at primary outcome of mortality at 60 days. However, because of the high rate of crossover, there was found to be uh, no difference between the two groups at a midpoint check of the study. And uh, for that reason, this trial was terminated early, which they said was due to futility, but subgroup analysis um, after the publication of the study, uh, if you remove the crossover group, uh, suggested there was significant benefit. So to those who believe in ECMO, this trial proved that ECMO does work. To those who don't believe in ECMO, it proved to them it didn't work, and we're sort of still in the same uh, place that we were. But I'm, I'm definitely one of the ones that believe and believe that this trial was, was uh, more proof of that. Um, but probably the bigger thing that came from this trial is a very strict and now widely accepted protocol of when ECMO should be used. And this was um, a graphic summary um, that was uh, published actually by the Columbia Group and a good friend, Daryl Abrams, who this is the protocol that they use. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing uh, in detail. It's basically just saying, you know, when you should consider ECMO for hypercarbia versus when you should consider it for uh, hypoxia and what you should be doing before you can consider ECMO. Um, but we've ad adopted a very similar protocol, and I just uh, summarize it here, I think a little bit simpler form, um, which is that if your PDF ratio, um, so the ratio of your um, you know, uh, blood oxygen to your inspired oxygen is less than 80 for over six hours, despite the use of 100% FiO2 on a ventilator. That's someone who meets a strong indication for ECMO, uh, assuming that uh, maximum medical management has already been carried out. Same thing for hypercarbia. If your pH arterially is less than 7.25 with a PCO2 of over 60 for six hours, uh, this is another group that would benefit from going on to VV ECMO. And then, uh, 
probably the strongest indication, but one that's uh, the one that stares least in your face is that if you're unable to limit airway pressures, specifically if you're unable to limit plateau pressure in the lung to less than 30 to 33, despite low tidal volume ventilation, or if the low tidal volumes that you have to use to achieve these pressure targets result in intolerable hypercapnia, this is probably the group that benefits most from ECMO, which is uh, removing the injury that's coming from the ventilator, which comes with high plateau pressures. So now you've evaluated the patient, you've determined that they have the indication for ECMO, but whether or not the patient is a good candidate for ECMO is a separate question. And this is a very uh, complicated question to answer and takes a lot of clinical experience, and which is why we work as a group when making these decisions. Um, but the main things that I think that you know, we think about when determining whether or not this patient is a good candidate is, first of all, the age. Obviously, the younger you are, the more likely you are to benefit from ECMO because the more likely you are to survive in general. Uh, second is how, how high is the BMI? Uh, this affects two things. One, it affects how easy it is to get the lines in without complication. And then the second is, is how likely the patient will be able to receive adequate flow from the ECMO circuit, which I'll go through a little bit more uh, in the next couple slides. Um, specifically with COVID, does the patient have other organ systems affected? Many patients are advocating that once the renal uh, system becomes affected, that the patient is now a very poor candidate for ECMO. We don't consider this as an exclusion here, but it's definitely a big negative detractor if you do have um, other significant other end organ injury. Um, does the patient have a significant vasopressor requirement, which you know prompts the evaluation, which I mentioned in the first few slides of why is this vasopressor requirement there? Because most of the time with COVID itself, you're not seeing very high vasopressor requirements. Um, one of the biggest and one of the biggest exclusion uh, criteria also that uh, we have is the length of intubation. So the uh, National Body of ECMO also came out with a very strong recommendation that said once a patient has been intubated for seven days or more, that their likelihood of benefiting from ECMO is, is much, much lower. So some centers use a strict cutoff of seven days that once you've been intubated seven days, you're no longer a candidate. Again, we don't treat it as a, uh, as a uh, absolute contraindication, but again, like the other organ systems being affected, if you've been intubated for more than seven days, it's a very big negative. And then just overall, the expected probability of survival of the patient um, answers the question of whether or not they're a good candidate, which uh, you know is affected directly by all these other variables that I mentioned. But we do have uh, formalized risk scores that have been published. The most common one that we use here and is used uh, nationally and internationally is something called the RESP score. Uh, it stands for Respiratory ECMO Survival Predictive Score. And uh, you could see the variables that go into this uh, score on the right. And um, uh, you know, we fill this out for every patient as a, as a guess to what their likelihood of survival is. But what at least I have noticed is that um, prior to COVID, uh, the presence of viral pneumonia was actually a predictor of survival because those patients were likely to improve um, with supportive care. With COVID, you know, I think we're all seeing that that's not always the case at all. And uh, so my point is, is that this score actually predicts higher survival with the presence of viral pneumonia. And uh, for that reason, I think that survival predictive um, numbers that are coming from this score are being overestimated when it comes to COVID versus other things. So this score definitely needs to be interpreted with caution, uh, but we still do use it as a uh, objective way to help to make these decisions. So uh, just to go over some uh, interesting management points for those of you who may see this in the CCU. So, you know, even if it works, even if you're a good candidate, there's definitely um, issues with managing VV ECMO. And uh, one of the most common issues is something called recirculation. And what recirculation means is that you could see uh, in this picture here on the right, there's a cannula that's in the IVC, which is draining blood, uh, you know, from the right atrium. And then you have your line that's putting the blood back after it receives oxygen from the ECMO circuit. The problem comes when these two lines are close together, when the blood is coming through this cannula into the right atrium, instead of being sent into the right ventricle and then sent throughout the rest of the body, if these cannulas are too close to one another, the oxygenated blood is just sucked up into the um, IVC cannula and instead of sending the oxygenated blood to the body, it just recirculates it through the machine. So this is something that needs to be thought about both during line placement, uh, 
um, through cannulation method selection and then also as an ongoing management in the ICU. And there's some different ways to do this that I think we could talk about as another time, but just understanding that in general, limiting recirculation is one of the most effective ways to ensure a good outcome with ECMO is an important thing to know. Probably the more uh, pertinent issue specifically with COVID in with everything, but especially with COVID, is that it's very difficult to use VV ECMO in patients with high cardiac output states, especially if their body habitus is big. So the amount of oxygenation that you receive systemically from an ECMO circuit is dependent directly upon what portion of the cardiac output can be captured by the machine. Meaning that if you have five liters of cardiac output as you normally would, if you can flow five liters of blood per minute through your ECMO machine, then you should receive very good oxygenation. However, if you're in a cytokine storm, hyperdynamic state, and your cardiac output is eight, nine, 10, it is really hard to get an ECMO flow, a machine to flow over six liters unless you use prohibitively big lines. So you're gonna be left with the problem of not being able to capture all of the cardiac output, and therefore even with ECMO may not adequately oxygenate. So this is a significant problem. So this is why high BMIs are excluded and patients that have significant vasodilatory shock are also excluded because the ECMO machine just cannot flow high enough to meaningfully capture enough cardiac output to improve systemic oxygenation. So this is all good, but does it work for COVID? Well, the answer is, is that we don't really know and there's been very limited uh, publications to date on this subject. The one that's probably mentioned the most was the Chinese study that was published in Lancet a few months ago. And they didn't describe specifically ECMO patients, they described all of the patients that were treated with COVID-19 in a Wuhan hospital. Of this large cohort of patients, six of the patients were placed on ECMO as a salvage. Um, and five and six of the patients uh, that were placed on ECMO had died by the time of the publication of the study. So I think that this gave very um, strong warning to everybody who uses ECMO to treat ARDS that this is not the same disease, that the outcomes are not gonna be as good, um, and that this should be used very cautiously. Um, then the Japanese got hit, and the Japanese have this centralized ECMO system called ECMO-NET, um, and they adopted a, a different approach. They said, let's use ECMO early and often uh, because we're good at it, and let's see if we get better results. And, and they did. They got much, much better results. You could see here that the survival rates are, are much, much higher. They only had um, uh, two deaths out of 32 patients. But the question comes as well, is this because they have found something that you know, gives better treatment of COVID? Or are they just putting patients on ECMO that if not put on ECMO probably would have survived anyway? And this is a very difficult question to answer and which has been asked over and over both for COVID and not. Um, then the other objective data we have is that, you know, when this compassionate use of remdesivir, uh, remdesivir trial came out in uh, the New England Journal, um, you know, even though it wasn't specifically discussed, there was uh, a subgroup of patients that received remdesivir that were put on ECMO, and uh, Dr. Topol in on his Twitter actually um, sent this uh, figure that he went through and he picked out the patients that received remdesivir and then were put on ECMO and how did they do. And uh, you know, he, he noted here that of the 17 patients um, that were receiving invasive ventilation and those who were receiving ECMO, 75% uh, of them were able to come off ECMO um, after receiving remdesivir. So this argued that you know, the combination of ECMO plus remdesivir may, may definitely have a role for the treatment of COVID because of the um, numbers here that were success. It was a very small number, but it was a good signal. Um, and, you know, based off all of this and an effort to just remove uh, administrative and medical legal barriers that may prevent uh, the adequate treatment of patients, the FDA actually came out in April and uh, for the first time approved ECMO to treat COVID-19 patients, um, again, to remove that, that barrier that may be there medical legally. And, you know, despite the, you know, formalized data being published that suggests that this is beneficial for COVID, uh, you've definitely seen all of these uh, individual studies publicized in the media about how uh, COVID-19 is treated successfully with ECMO. This is a picture that came from an Arizona hospital, uh, but they're coming from everywhere. There was a New York Times article that was published from MGH that showed a, a miraculous survival for a patient that was on ECMO for a prolonged period of time. Um, 
but again, are these individual case studies, is it actually a population-based benefit that we really don't know? Uh, the closest we have is that the National ECMO Society ELSO is doing a, a good job tracking all of the patients that are put on internationally for COVID-19 into onto ECMO. They came out with a guidance document that said when patients should be put on to ECMO, and they basically said you should use the same criteria as you normally do, but if your resources are limited, you should also limit ECMO. And they also said something which has been brought up multiple times is that if you're not already an ECMO center, you shouldn't become an ECMO center for the exclusive purpose of treating COVID-19 patients. So this is strongly advised against based on this uh, summary document. But they continue to track uh, what the outcomes are uh, for those that are put on ECMO. So um, this is the most, I took this from last night, this was the total count uh, internationally of patients that have COVID that were put on ECMO, 844 suspected or confirmed, 831 uh, cases of confirmed, and then uh, 139 of 287 were uh, discharged alive. Uh, so this is a pretty, this is the highest metric you'll see, I think, of a, a predictor of um, survival on ECMO. And even though this number sounds low, it's actually very high because you have to think about how sick these patients are. But the problem with this is, is that two things. One, they've excluded data from all centers that they don't consider expert centers. So you're flawed by only looking at the data from very, very experienced centers. And second, all of these centers have different thresholds on when to use ECMO. So when you look at ECMO outcomes in centers that are very restrictive, like ours and most of the New York centers because of the way that we chose to limit resources up front, you're gonna find numbers that are much, much lower than this. And then if you look specifically at the places that at this time have more resources available that are using ECMO for uh, weaker indications, you'll find a much higher survival rate. Uh, so what have we done logistically to ECMO care here because of COVID-19? Well, one thing is, is that ECMO CPR is not being offered. So, you know, normally if a patient was a young, otherwise healthy person that suffered unexpected cardiac arrest, especially from a pulmonary embolism or something that's known to be reversible, uh, the patient could be put on ECMO with chest compressions in progress and uh, as a salvage method. But because of the uh, difficulty of that technically and because of the high provider exposure rate, uh, all New York hospitals have stopped offering ECMO CPR, including ourselves. Um, transport ECMO has also been put on hold, so we've received many calls from outside hospitals, both within the system and out, asking could we come there, put the patient on ECMO, and then bring the patient back to the main campus. And again, because of the uh, high uh, rate of exposure, but also the high use of resources to do something like that, um, our transport ECMO program has been put on hold. Um, we've also been very strict about avoiding multiple cannulators on a single patient because there's probably, you know, four cannulators here that are uh, consistently doing this. And if we're using two to three per case and God forbid there's a, you know, release of COVID in the room when that happens and three of the four cannulators become infected, it would be a big problem. So we've been very strict about um, trying to keep to one to two cannulators to avoid that from happening. Uh, anticoagulation is a very important thing on ECMO. Um, in general, but even more specifically for, um, for COVID, because like we've mentioned before, uh, these patients are more prone to clotting. And uh, that includes clotting off the entire circuit to the point that it needs to be replaced. And that's been described multiple other places, including here. Um, so for that reason, people are much more aggressive with anticoagulation, both in terms of the drug that they're using and in terms of the PTT that they target. And uh, so for here, we're using heparin during cannulation but uh, we're using a bivalirudin infusion afterward just to eliminate the group that are just heparin under responders or non-responders to prevent uh, unnecessary clotting. Uh, patients have received TPA in the ICUs and uh, that's not being treated as a contraindication. So even if you've received TPA, you can still go on to ECMO. Uh, one of the interesting things that's being discussed now is uh, can you use a cytokine filter in the circuit so that the ECMO is then treating the cytokine storm itself. So there's a couple of different um, you know, brand name groups that are looking at this. The probably most common one is this thing called Cytosorb. So uh, we've been approached about doing clinical trial of using this Cytosorb in the, um, in the ECMO circuit. However, the inclusion criteria they want are almost prohibitively restrictive. Uh, so it hasn't been able to be used yet. I don't think that you'll see a lot of it. Um, but they are also trying to use it in CBVH machines, uh, which I think probably you'll see more of, but they too are having major issues with clotting and adding another thing to the CBVH line may even increase that problem further. Uh, 
Uh, one of the other difficult things is with weaning. So if patients, when they go on ECMO for COVID, man, they're on ECMO for a long time. There's a patient that's in KCC6 right now who's been on ECMO for or over four weeks. And um, there's been multiple runs of, you know, four or five weeks um, in both the United States and in China. And some never have lung recovery, despite having recovery of their other organs and even their mental status. And what do you do with these patients? No one knows, but the Chinese now reporting multiple case reports. For some reason, it's coming in the media and not in medical journals, but um, multiple case reports of using lung transplantation as a way to wean from ECMO for patients that have survived but are just not being able to wean because of end-stage fibrotic lung disease. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if this, uh, you know, is done at all in the United States or anywhere outside of China. Um, but in the three to four uh, cases that have been done in China, apparently the results have been good, and I'm looking forward to a forum publication on this. Um, so just to go through our experience briefly, we've put eight on ECMO for the indication of respiratory failure. There's still two on ECMO and KCC6. Um, one was decannulated and doing quite well. All end organs are intact, mental status is intact, and he's on tray collar on the floor getting ready to be discharged. Um, two were able to be successfully weaned ECMO, but then died of uh, nosocomial complications of prolonged hospitalization later in their hospital course. And then three of the eight patients died on ECMO. Again, it's important when looking at this data to remember that we are one of the most restrictive centers with using ECMO, like most centers in New York, because of how hard we were hit. Um, so these numbers will be uh, impacted by the fact that this is the sickest subgroup of patients that go on ECMO um, uh, when looking at it. So in conclusion, in summary, there's definitely a role for ECMO and mechanical support in general for COVID-19, but it remains unclear who will benefit the most how to ration these resources, how late is too late for the use of mechanical support, and uh, also the very interesting question of how to care for the unweanable patient that might have otherwise recovered. So uh, thank you all for listening, and thanks, Dr. Goldman, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Greg. Can you tell us a little bit um, about those uh, eight patients? How long were they on ECMO? Um, and how many patients total did you evaluate? So what was the denominator? Eight is the numerator of patients yeah. that got ECMO. How many patients were evaluated and you thought weren't good candidates and maybe review why they weren't? And then what was the duration of those eight patients um, who you died on ECMO, but um, how long had they had ECMO in? Yeah, so um, all good questions. Remind me if I forget any of them. So first in terms of how many patients were evaluated, um, a lot. You know, I think that it all depends on the provider, but almost all of these patients could have an ECMO consult because of how sick they are. I think personally myself, I've evaluated somewhere in the number of 40 to 50. And uh, what we've found is that uh, the use of inhaled nitric oxide uh, was able to uh, push a patient through without ECMO, um, without reaching an indication for ECMO. And um, that's what, you know, we've had a lot of success with. Now, is that just putting a Band-Aid on the problem and then delaying ECMO when it might be needed? Well, we don't know. But there's uh, a good thought process that because of the um, uh, clotting issues that we're seeing, maybe nitric is helping uh, by same ways it would for, um, uh, you know, pulmonary hypertension. So maybe there is a benefit to ECMO, uh, to inhaled nitric that we shouldn't be ignoring. Um, the um, uh, the other question in terms of how long the patients are on ECMO. So the patients that died on ECMO, they, they died early. Um, and it was probably because they were too far gone. But I, I could tell you from personal experience, uh, it's very, very difficult to say no to either a young person or especially a healthcare provider uh, once they develop an indication for ECMO. So even those, you know, a lot of these patients that died on ECMO were probably too sick to get on ECMO. It's just very emotionally difficult not to offer this technology to someone who got infected and treating these patients like we are. Um, the run times for the patients that were on ECMO that, that did, so the, the run times for the patients that died on ECMO were short, but the run times for the people that came off ECMO were long, at least a week. Um, and like I said, we do have that four week patient that's still in the CCU. I'm gonna say that probably the average run time is gonna come down to somewhere around, around two weeks is my guess. Did that answer all of your questions or was there one more? No, it was excellent. Can you also tell us, because in the broad spectrum of mechanical support, um, how many patients were given intra balloon pumps or impellers during this same time? Yeah. Where the issue 
uh, of you know the circulatory support. Yeah, so so we haven't used VA ECMO. Um, there was one patient that was put on VA V ECMO for reasons of massive pulmonary embolus and cardiac arrest. Um, we've used three intraaortic balloon pumps, and we've used no impella. Okay, thank you. That was really great. Any other, are there any um, other questions from the audience? Hey, Greg, it's uh, Sean. Um, first of all, what a fantastic presentation! Uh, really? So eloquent delivered and really uh, informative. Thanks. About four or five weeks ago, I was on a, a call with um, physicians and surgeons from PTA uh, Salpetriere in Paris. And what was so remarkable was at the time we had put one, maybe two patients on ECMO, and they had put literally 150 patients on ECMO. And my moderator asked the, the speaker, like, are you sure 150? So that experience is so far beyond the pale of what's happening, not only here in New York, but at most other academic ECMO centers where the, the volume of cases is really right around in the single digits to low double digits. Have you seen anything from Paris? Have they written up their experience? Uh, so I saw something informally published uh, last week, actually Don, Dr. Ani pointed out to me that they, they've done over 400 now. Um, and uh, you know, their, their theory is early ECMO works. Um, they don't think they're just cannulating patients that would have otherwise survived. Um, but the results are not completely compelling yet. Um, I think that they were publishing survival rates somewhere in the 50% range, uh, but they're, they're using it a lot. But they're, they're a country that is obsessed with ECMO. I mean, even before this, they do ECMO CPR on the streets and... Um, so they're, they're, they have a very robust system and they're very, very strong believers of ECMO. Is that gonna pan out to be something? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if you were on the call last week when um, I think UPenn was asking, uh, you know, could we start a, a national study of early ECMO specifically for the treatment of COVID to see if there's a signal of uh, improvement? And I, I think that there's a lot of interest in doing that both here, Dr. Gidwani strongly advocating for that and elsewhere in the United States and internationally. Uh, Greg, this wanna... is Donna. Hey, Dr. Um, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I was just wondering, in the patients who recover but remain on ECMO because of persistent lung dysfunction, are they referred for lung transplant? Yeah, so we have one patient right now that uh, is being strongly uh, considered for that because we kind of thought he was gone, and then uh, two days ago he woke up and followed command. So he's... Uh, He's actually doing pretty well, and all of his other organs are intact, liver, kidney, now brain, and he has remained fully dependent on ECMO flow for over four weeks. So we're still hoping that he could be weaned, but uh, referral to a lung transplant center is definitely what's going to happen if, if he can't be. Thank you. Any other questions? Greg, um, again, wonderful talk, really excellent. I give you so much credit for, number one, taking on uh, this task of uh, ECMO in the cath lab and expanding the indications, the finesse you've demonstrated, really dealing with so many different services and making this interdisciplinary, um, which has been fantastic, um, and really for the courage in taking on these very difficult patients in a very difficult time certainly exposing yourself and the team uh, to increased risk. So um, I just want to thank you very much uh, for all the work you've done, uh, for the support and teaching that you've done, and really for an excellent lecture this morning. Um, thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.